Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This episode, we're joined by Michael McConkie of Edible Landscaping outside of Charlottesville, Virginia. Michael's company sells everything you need to grow in the landscape from shrubs to berries to vines to trees. And he's been in the business for 40 years, if you can believe that. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. So can you believe it's been, I went and checked out your LinkedIn profile and it said you started in March of 1980. Yeah, that's about it. Um, 19, I remember 1979, January, we were in a, uh, I was focused in an organic gardening um, magazine article. I guess I was the main person. Um, I had like a nine page um report and what we did in um, what we did in the garden back in Adelphi, Maryland, way back in in the 70s. So that was actually my first starting point was uh, was back in Adelphi. Hmm, Wow. So you're local to the D.C. area. And what made you establish the farm all the way out? Um, It's Afton, Virginia, actually, A-F-T-O-N. So I met Jeannie, my wife, and um, I actually had a, a nursery going at the time, and I was doing some landscaping. But we left D.C., uh, I think with like 35 bucks, and came down here. We did some house sitting, and I was trying to fit everything together, but I guess uh, fate had me on the good side, and I, um, I just became uh, edible landscaping, and I think... Um, 1980, 1984, I was still struggling trying to find something, but 1987, we landed here at our current location in Afton. And what were you looking for land-wise? What what did you think would be an ideal place? I guess I do have a little story about that because, um, I had a friend, he said, oh, there's 50 acres for sale over here and, um, why don't we split it? And I, uh, I said, okay, I'll go look at it. And it was all woods. It was on the south slope of a hillside. Um, Nothing around us but trees for miles and miles. Just beautiful like the George Washington forest. Um, And I walked through it. And the first thought I had was, Thomas Jefferson would love to grow fruit trees here. This has got good drainage. It's, It's, you know, it's warm here. And it did turn out to be quite a microclimate, um, and so we were able to uh, grow a lot of things um, in a strong 7B kind of agricultural zone. Yeah, so um, so with that, I said, sure, I'll take the top part, you take the bottom, and that's what he wanted anyway. And so I got, I got the land, um, uh, and... We paid for the land because we were selling hardy kiwis and there was nobody else in the country selling hardy kiwis. That's a whole nother story in itself um, of how the nursery kind of started. Um, And I should say something about that, but I don't want to get too far off your question. (laughs) (laughs) No, no. Do share about the hardy kiwis. So were you selling the plants or the actual fruit? The plants. And what happened uh, I was traveling, I think at the time, I was in a group called the Natural Hygiene Society, and they promoted like fasting and raw foods and things like that. And this fellow, the president, asked me to be on the board. So they had this meeting up in Boston. Well, it, and I took advantage of that because I always wanted to meet this fruit breeder named Dr. Meter. He kind of looked like uh, the Quaker Oats guy, you know, he was he was Quaker. He, he had that that nice little uh, round face, big smile with the beard and no mustache, you know. Is that Meter, M-E-T-E-R? Oh, I'm sorry, Meter, M-E-A-D-E-R. Ah, okay, go on. And he was a professor of uh, horticulture at uh, in Durham, um, 
let's see, University of New Hampshire, I guess. And he was a fruit breeder, and I knew about him. And so I went and visited him for the weekend. And this guy was like, oh, I want to be like him kind of person. He grew just everything. Uh, he had all his own food, and he introduced some of the some plants that are still being sold today, uh, Reliance Peach, Fall Gold, Raspberry. He just, he just dabbled in almost everything. And that was the first hardy kiwi I saw. I walked uh, up to it, and the fruit was actually ripe, and I was pretty delighted. And he said, uh, I'm getting older now, and I'm wondering if you'd like to propagate these for people that want some. And I said, sure. So he sent me like 25 sticks, and I put them in the ground, and they rooted. And then he was in a National Magazine article, and one thing led to another. Uh, my brother, I, I was living in my brother's backyard in a yurt. And it was about two acres, and I had a garden there. And all of a sudden, my brother's mailbox was just full of orders from the National Gardening magazine. You may remember that magazine, but um, it was it was Dr. Meter uh, talking about kiwis, and there was a picture of him on the front cover. And he said at the end of the article, "If you want any of these kiwis, uh, just." Um, send uh send a request to michael mcconkey so that's how that's how edible landscaping started i got about fourteen thousand dollars worth of orders and i had 25 plants wow quite a kickoff to the business there now i want to dial back a bit and talk about this yurt in your brother's backyard so your brother is in the tacoma park adelphi area right um cool spring road which is pretty much um, an extension of Campus Drive near the University of Maryland. It's in, it's in the woods. Uh, it's off of University Boulevard. And he had a, a really nice uh, yard with a pool. And his land went back to the Northwest Branch uh, Park and, and the, you know, the creek that runs through there. So I was pretty much in the back there in up against the woods. And then I had this whole open yard to plant anything I wished. And of course, I was a big pen pal at that time with many, many people, especially a group called the North American Fruit Explorers. And they were amateurs. Um, I, think that's how, I think that's how I met Dr. Meter. So and then I would travel to different meetings of these guys. And these guys would have different meetings like at Cornell University or at Maryland University, things like that. And everybody would talk about fruits and everybody was avid about it. And and that amateur kind of feeling prevailed. Uh, people were excited about trying to grow different things. And of course, I wanted to grow fruit, but I wanted to do it organically. And I wanted to uh, maintain a good diet by, you know, growing my own things. And what was it like uh, living in that yurt? So that was just like a big giant tent, basically. No, because I, I made it... Um, well, uh, you know, Bonnie Raitt's brother actually built yurts at Glen Echo Amusement Park in the 70s. And I was lucky enough to see them. But they were they were not like, um, you know, ribbing and, and yuck hide. They were more substantial. They were made of like two by fours. And, and uh, with, you know, with the, does everybody know what a, yurt looks like it looks like a cupcake in a way it has that outward the walls go up and outward and and the roof does too and there's a skylight in the middle and mine was about 15 feet in diameter and it was all rugs inside um so it was quite a little oasis and i hand built it um i pro my dad had a construction company in mount rainier ck mcconkey and sons and uh, i could go down there um, and pick up scraps. And so I, I just, I, I'm, I took measurements at Glen Echo and came back and made one. I think I spent $125, but it was a place for me to live and I could go right out in the garden every day and work. And that's what I did. Yeah. And that's funny that to, nowadays they're talking about accessory housing and, you know, tiny homes. And that was almost you know, a prototype what you did then. Yes, it was. It was a very tiny home. And I did, I was so much into gardening. I only worked at uh, a local organic food store 
called Beautiful Day up in College Park. I think one day a week I do the I do their produce because they were the first ones to get organic produce into the D.C. area. And so I would uh, they liked the way I set up the produce. So I was hired for that. But usually I was just in the garden or I was uh, playing guitar, you know, passing the hat kind of thing. I didn't make very much money, but I, I did work very hard. <laughs> <laughs> and your father had a construction business at McConkie and Sons. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like the and Sons part worked or is there another brother who's working for them yeah there was a little black sheep uh oh yeah my my brothers scott kenny and bruce they all worked in the in the uh organization and i did not um so my my history pretty much was uh coming out of the uh coming out of college um at which i didn't graduate I got kind of academic probation for um, playing music and bands and and chasing uh, girls and women and whatever. So uh, I didn't do very well. I think the third semester at Maryland, uh, I got on academic probation. And then I went to Canada with some friends of mine, and I made a living for five years playing music. Um, And that also instilled in me what fresh produce was all about because I was in the middle of this kind of – Southern Ontario, San Francisco kind of coffee house situation in Stratford, Ontario. And Stratford um, is known for, you know, plays and Shakespeare and all that. So um, that was that was a great time for me. And and everybody there were uh, they had local produce. You know, everybody was uh, growing things and back to the land movement was happening. So I was caught up in all that. And and, then. it affected me a lot. So when I started my nursery, uh, there was more, it wasn't a real Harvard business sense that I had. I just, I had a real desire to grow things. So I'd have, I'd I'd have good food to eat. Hmm. And what sparked you as a child to even start gardening? My mom, she had a, uh, we lived in Adelphi and the end of our lot kind of ended at the, at the old mill and the, uh, um, Northwest Branch Park, but there was um, there was a hillside that it had kind of eroded, and she gave it to me. She said, "You want a garden there?" <laughs> and I was this kind of kid that would go down in the woods every day and pick turtles up and bring them home, and had I had my own little zoo, all that kind of stuff. So um, so yeah, I took the garden and I, I'd go in the woods and I'd find pretty things that I thought were pretty, and I'd try to grow them on this hillside. And of course, the most of the shade loving plants didn't do very well, but uh, yucca and, and, um, tiger lily and all those, they, they did really well. So that was my first gardening experience was because my mom gave me this hillside to do something with. And she just let you have free reign of whatever you wanted to plant there. Oh yeah. Because (laughs) it was, you know, it was almost funny, you know, if I had, if I, I guess I was impressed with, oh boy, I could garden, but it was like, I don't think she looked at it like uh, an eyesore. So, <laughs> and were there many edibles on that hillside when you started? No, no. And I, I think the edible whole consciousness came much later when, you know, when I started changing my diet and, and, uh, yeah, the seventies kind of back to the land movement. Yeah. Hmm. Well, let's fast forward to this spring. Um, and you have a successful edible landscaping mail order business and i often run into you at events like uh monticello's heritage harvest festival that happens every september um and you'll come up to the dc area to give talks you've spoken to my garden club and and even sang to my garden club (laughs) which we enjoyed um but obviously with that not happening this year how is business record year What can I say? I was really surprised. Uh, We were so busy. I really didn't have time to reflect. I could only react. I think there was like three reasons for that. Um, I think some people really felt that they needed to provide for their own, their own way in, in food producing because maybe, maybe things would get shut down or there wouldn't be such, you know, a whole lot available. So I did see some people that were kind of into that. Uh, then there were other people that just didn't have a job anymore and were staying home. And I think it's natural for a person to garden. 
And of course, if you have your own home, you, you know, you like the garden. I think in, in America, it's, we just have such busy lives that we always don't get a chance to garden a lot. So this year, a lot of people gardened a lot. And I think they, they, they bit off a big mouthful. You know, they, they, I think they planted a lot more than usual because they had the time. What was the third thing? There must be a third thing. I'm not coming. <laughs> I said three hmm. things. <laughs> there is one more. We'll get to that later, I guess. Come on, Mike. Yeah, if it comes to you. So you're saying uh, they now have the time to garden or they had the um, imperative they felt to grow their own food. Yeah. And I also think that uh, there's a there's a whole national movement of even commercial places or permaculture becoming uh, uh, young people, you know, kind of wanting to see parks that are edible um, or, or just even street scenes where, you know, where you have just a a, a curbside uh, where it used to be just grass or something. They want to put a, maybe a small tree or a blueberry or something like that. It's always fun. You know, when you see, a plant that's free for all. I, I'm thinking of uh, D.C., um, not DuPont Circle. Oh, P Street Beach. I remember the exit off of P Street Beach. This was years ago. And I was taking the turn, and I looked to my left, and I saw five blueberry bushes just growing um, on the on the left side of that exit. And that kind of stuff just really got me. I got so happy when I'd see that. And, and because that was, you know, basically free food. Uh, and I, I like that. I like that whole community commitment to to uh, being more in touch with nature and, you know, what trees are good. Um, you know, there is a lot of by the roadsides. I'm sure most of the people that are spraying or cutting down the uh, the different trees to keep the roads clear, they don't really have a clue of as to what which ones they're cutting down. And I think if the pawpaw's growing or a or a. Uh, Juneberry, you know, or elderberry, I think they should be spared for sure. So with these new customers this spring, uh, was there anything that sold out immediately in your inventory or was was the most popular? Well, I was fortunate that some of the suppliers that we have, um, instead of ordering once from them, we ordered three times and they kept on providing uh, enough enough. Uh, plants so that that we look like we had something here although there were a few people who say boy you guys are really low in in uh, inventory but i don't think we ever really got that low and we have propagating we have three propagate excuse me propagating greenhouses so uh, we also you know produce our own plants um and that was you know that was good that we that we were able to pull from suppliers and also have our own so, and oh, what was the biggest seller? Uh, in the last few years, I think it's always been pawpaws. Um, they are uh, in demand and they're a native uh, North American fruit. And there's been a lot of work. I know that Neil Peterson's done a lot of work with them. So they are the, the biggie. Uh, I, I remember one year, uh, because we were mentioned in a Martha Stewart uh, Stewart uh, magazine article about Meyer lemons. We sold the heck out of Meyer lemons one year, but um, we usually do bioregional plants, plants that grow in this area. Uh, we find that's a, a lot better. Um, we have a lot of plants that a lot of companies maybe brush on, but we get kind of micro into them. We we may have eight or nine varieties of say pomegranate, which for Virginia is a little strange, or for Washington D.C. But it's not at all. There's there's some really good uh, varieties that grow here, and most of our fruits, um, the ones that really sell well, are the are the ones that mm, maybe aren't as popular. You know, a lot of people, consumers, they know what they see in the stores, but a lot of the plants we sell, uh, you don't find it in the stores. Sometimes farmers markets, maybe. Yeah, I would think that it would make sense to have something in your garden or to grow. Uh, that you just can't walk down the street to, you know, your local supermarket and buy. And there's usually the reason that it just doesn't keep well. And obviously, pawpaw is a great uh, example of that, that shipping pawpaws would be a nightmare. 
<laughs> by the time they made it onto the store shelves, they'd be badly bruised. Yeah, and Bill Davis in Westminster, Maryland, is about the only commercial pawpaw grower that I know that actually does send ripe pawpaws through the mail and gets them there in one piece. Uh, he is, I guess he's uh, quite the talent at that. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that you do have a local source. And that sometimes if you went to DuPont Circle, I know that uh, people used to bring pawpaws in from like, if they, if they were farmers from Frederick or uh, Harper's Ferry. Very occasionally, and they get snapped up so quickly that if you weren't there during the first hour of the DuPont Circle Farmer's Market, you'd never have known that they were there. So I find that very true of a lot of the seasonal fruit these days. Yeah, I think so. And um, I've got my blueberries right now covered. A lot of people think maybe blueberries are over for local consumption, but I've, we have so many varieties and we have a lot of late varieties. And then you know, they turn blue on the on the plant, but that doesn't mean they've reached their fullest potential as far as sweetness. So uh, I've got them kind of netted and uh, it's really a joy to go out there and pick them right now. And pawpaws, you know, uh, we want everybody to taste the pawpaw for sure in its perfect state. And that usually does mean that um, it, it might have dropped off the tree the night before and then it's perfect to eat. But um, a day earlier or two days earlier, uh, maybe they, they taste a little green, you know. So uh, I always want the – in fact, when you mentioned that Monticello, I remember uh, I, I went to the Harvest Festival one year with maybe two bushels of pawpaws. And all I did all day was just cut them up and let people taste them because most people have not tasted a pawpaw. The blueberries, the later versions, varieties you mentioned, uh, can you name a few of those? Uh, yeah, one of my favorites is Yadkin. Um, it's uh, an Aglockany, uh, which is a new one from Georgia. Um, Pink Lemonade is fairly late. Uh, let's see, what else is out there right now? Uh, Climax is late, and so is Powder Blue. And hmm. yes, and do I recall that Pink Lemonade was one of the ones that you only need one blueberry that you don't need to have two to cross. I think, I think generally you only need one blueberry, but, but if you have two, sometimes the berries are larger because I think it, it, it pollinates them and makes a little bit more seed or makes a, a make it makes a little bit bigger berry. But, um, I, I don't plant them alone here because I'm such an avid fan of them. It's one of those plants. There's, they're, they're just, there's, once you get the soil right on a blueberry, you know, once you give it lots of mulch or, or high organic matter, that's what it really, it loves to grow in that. I think they evolved by coming, you know, from the woods. And so leaf litter and little sticks that fell from the trees, that kind of rotting vegetation, that top, that kind of top soil is so perfect for a blueberry. They really respond to it. Whereas if they're grown in clay, they will not, they just won't grow. Even the, and you, and I'm sorry, but there is a lot of um, varieties that are very soil specific or organic matter specific, such as some of the New Jersey bog berries that were introduced earlier. Um, the first ones, blue crop, blue ray. Um, some people can grow them. I can't grow them here. They, they're just too finicky. Uh, the southern type blueberries, though, uh, called rabbit eyes, and now they've been breeding them and, and uh, uh, hybridizing them with uh, northern and southern species together. S that's some of your best berries, and they're very adaptable. Mm, now you're making me want some blueberry pancakes right now. <laughs> that's sounding so good. So um, for propagating, so you mentioned you're propagating greenhouses. Uh, what plants are you normally propagating on site there? Not everything is easy to root. So some, some plants are graftable only. So that would be your, most of your tree fruits like apples, peaches, plums, pears, persimmons. The, um, there's a lot of plants though that do well with, if you take a cutting and, uh, you do it the right way, you'll get, you'll get it to root. 
I'm sure lots of people, even beginners, know that a, you know, a willow branch will root quite easily. So um, we look for those ones that, that root easily. And I think the first one that comes to mind is hardy kiwi, fig, pomegranate. Uh, and blueberries, though specific, you have to root them in peat moss. They uh, they root quite readily too. Yeah, figs I think are one of those that many beginners attempt and, and do well at for propagating themselves. And then um, those that you graft, you're grafting them obviously onto hardy rootstock. Um, I think a lot of uh, gardeners aren't aware that their apple tree or their cherry tree or their pear came on hardier stock below and that they should be cutting off any of those whips or you know the little um, seedlings that are coming up around the tree because they're not going to come true to that apple that you're that they're actually growing yeah so so root root stocks or what you graft on can be can sucker and so you don't want them to take over. We had an email yesterday, and and someone had a, a ten year old, two thousand thirteen, so seven year old persimmon tree, and they were in the D.C. area, and uh, they had this really beautiful Asian persimmon, um, about five feet tall, and then they had a fifteen foot tall American persimmon uh, that was the rootstock that it had had established itself. So. Uh, so basically, she has to cut that rootstock off if she wants that Asian persimmon to do well. So that's that's the kind of grafting thing that that happens. Now, and you're right about seeds. Um, the reason you graft, like say a um, an apple, like an Arkansas black apple, is because there's only one original Arkansas black apple, and that the seed from that tree will not come true. Generally, that's true for just about any of the popular fruits. But the only exception I'm thinking of right now, Bella Georgia peach will come true to seed. But most others, uh, you'll just get something of the character, whoever pollinated it. You know, there's, say you have uh, two peaches in your yard, all those seedlings will have pollen from each one. So like people, you will not get the same, you will not get the same um, outcome. It'll be different. Hmm. And there are annual apple tastings and comparisons, um, including at that uh, Monticello Heritage Harvest Festival that we mentioned earlier. Um, you're usually a vendor at those, but do you also go around and collect, um, say, scion wood for some of those to propagate some of the older or heirloom apples? No, not so much just because a lot of the heirloom varieties are susceptible to different diseases that a lot of fruit breeders have been attempting to breed out of apples. So we we don't we have a short list of apples that we sell because they they cannot get cedar apple rust, which is well you know everybody uh, in our area probably knows the the uh, juniper virginiana, which is um, which is the cedars that had this orange ball in the spring and that spreads out and that's, uh, and their spores, uh, contact a symbiotic relationship with, with apples, June berries, a couple of other, uh, I think even pears, but you will, um, it can defoliate a tree. So it's, you can go buy a golden delicious apple, say at, um, at a nursery or a vendor that may not know any, any different, but, it's hard to get that plant to have leaves in the fall. And then that the bottom line is the, the fruits don't get very sweet and the tree suffers and sometimes goes into shock. So a lot of your commercial apples are sprayed a lot to control cedar apple rust, apple scab, and fire blight. And if I can find a tree that doesn't get those diseases, that's the one we sell. Yeah, because your philosophy is to grow organically. Yeah, yeah, that was always my main e- emphasis, and I really picked a hard one because, you know, at the time, um, and even still, even today, it's it's not an easy job to do on the East Coast. We probably it's probably harder here than anywhere. If you have a nice little yard in uh, Los Angeles, California, 
you probably can plant an apricot and a peach and a nectarine, and you just go out and you go and, and pick them. And I think it's because of their arid conditions there. They don't have the humidity and the rain that we have here. I think most of the uh, commercial cherry crops and um, um, what's a, uh, thinking of Washington State where they where they grow cherries almost in the desert, uh, where it doesn't really rain. They I think they um, I think they irrigate from a river, so everything is just watered on the ground. Um, cherries here, if they're ripening and it rains, you can almost kiss them goodbye. They're going to get they're going to get a disease called brown rot. So there are there are those that you know for a homeowner who wants to grow his own food, he has to be a little cautious and just not get what he sees in the food stores. Professionals grow them in areas of the country that are uh, a little easier say than the than the east coast. And are there any organic uh, sprays or precautions that you use when you're growing apples or pears or cherries or peaches? Yes, and I think it's more of a little bit of a revolution um, in in the, the, the new products that are coming on the market. And I know, um, just to mention one that I think is really good, Japanese beetles are, are, are pretty bad in our area. And sometimes... Um, a young tree can be, like a cherry tree, could be just defoliated uh, at this time of year. Um, there is a, a bacillus that's, uh, I think I think the trade name is Beetle Away. Uh, I tried it a few years ago. It just works superbly, so much better than the traps. And uh, um, yeah, and I was very, I'm very impressed with that. I'm also impressed with uh, neem, which, you know, was a, a tree from India. Uh, has an almond-like seed that's very oily, and it's been used for thousands of years uh, to combat different maladies that uh, that people or plants have. And science has uh, perfected some really good neem um, products. And so there's there's a lot of things like if if I get an outbreak of spider mites in my greenhouse, I can spray the neem with a bacillus, I, I think the trade name is microtrol or botanogard. Um, again, just a, a common organism that doesn't, it's not toxic to humans, but to some small bugs or something it can be. And it's real, it's real responsible science, I think. And I, I do see it uh, moving in the right direction. I know that my, um, one of my gardening, uh, well, he's the orchard man here, Dan Lefevre, he actually sold to Rutgers about 50 pounds of wormy fruit this year because they're doing all these um, experiments on plum curculio, which is a nemesis to the fruit trees like apples and peaches and plums. That's the worm in your fruit. And they're, very too, they're hard to control organically, but uh, there's a lot of work being done to find ways to control these pests. So it's... Uh, it's it's kind of right right at the beginning, you know. You're you're really starting to see that in the future there's a lot of promise. So you know that we don't have to use uh, toxic chemicals to get good fruit. Mm -hmm. And wonderful to hear there there's so much research going on behind the scenes. And moving up the pest scale, uh, we have to ask about deer, <laughs> which is a huge issue for a lot of DC area homeowners and gardeners, um, if somebody had severe deer pressure in their garden, what fruit might you recommend that they would be able to grow? First thing that comes into mind is pawpaw. Uh, now, they would they will eat the drop fruit if it's laid on the ground uh, too long. And of course, the same thing goes with persimmon. They don't usually browse on the trees to a point where they're, you know, where they're killing the tree. Um, Mulberries, yeah. mulberries, a different story. <laughs> they love mulberry leaves. Yeah. Yeah. For the, so for the persimmon, is that American persimmon, the native one? Well, that's what they're used to because, you know, the American persimmon kind of grows straight up if unattended and it'll get fairly tall. So they, they just wait for those fruits to fall. Um, in fact, most people don't know that, you know, American persimmon always puckers you. 
But if you put some nice dry straw on, around the tree that you've that you've chosen to get the fruit from, when they fall, they they lose their pucker, which is great. But that's that's when the deer at night they'll come under the trees. They know they know exactly where all the trees are, and uh, I have two in my yard like that. And uh, and then then I see the deer. Here we have a deer fence, and it's uh, it makes you feel very secure because it's and it's not that expensive it and you don't it blends in with the forest because i have it at the edge of the forest uh, it's about seven feet high and it's it is made of plastic and it lasts a pretty long time and it has a good strength you know if you if a running deer runs into it that kind of thing but uh i've always uh, it we've always had trouble here because uh, like dc there's a, a lot of canopy and uh, a lot of deer a lot of deer so versus native versus the Asian varieties, do you have particular favorites, say, in the pears, persimmons, and categories where we have both Asian and native choices? Yeah, and I think the, uh, I think the Asian choices are kind of unique in that they've been grown for so many thousands of years. You know, it's an older civilization, and they, in, and they were selected over those years uh, and they seem to adapt very well to our conditions. A lot of pear trees get fire blight, so you can grow a pear tree like maybe a Bosch pear, and it may grow for two or three years in the D.C. area, but it's it's bound to get fire blight at some time, and looks like it'll look like somebody took a match to it, and uh, it'll be dead. So, so we need pears that are fire blight resistant. That's the number one thing. Uh, and there are, you know, there's there's a uh, there's many of them that are. Or maybe I should say there's few that are of the many choices. Um, and what else were we talking about um, besides the pear? You said which which variety? Uh, the Asian persimmons or some of the Asian um, other alternatives to our natives. Yeah, the Asian persimmon is my favorite. And back in the 70s, I met Dr. Shanks at the University of Maryland and he was a Asian persimmon collector, and he handed uh, a lot of his enthusiasm and knowledge to me. And and since then, I've been kind of carrying that. And I have probably eighteen to twenty varieties of of Asian persimmon here at the nursery. And we even have a persimmon festival usually every year in October, right around Halloween, because I think they're that good. Also, they coincide with ripening with pomegranate, so it's quite a nice little uh, time to take orchard tours here at that time. So on the Asian persimmons, they um, some of them are, are quite dwarf. They don't get really big like an American persimmon, and their fruits are always large, and then a lot of times they're seedless. Um, and then also you can buy ones that never... Uh, I'm sorry, plant ones that never pucker. So they are, you can eat them hard like an apple. In fact, a lot of people would say, oh, I'd rather grow a persimmon than an apple because it's so pretty and I get the fruit and and that's it. You know, there's no blemishes or, or bugs that that really bother it as much as most apples. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to mention that it is one of the more pretty fruit trees just in itself even if you don't get any fruit from it yeah they almost have a magnolia like leaf it's very shiny very dark green the flowers are inconspicuous some of the varieties have beautiful red vivid color in the fall and then after a frost and the leaves fall you're left with a tree full of three inch diameter orange fruits that look like little pumpkins hanging all over the tree uh, and they're very, uh, of course, very popular in Asian countries. And I think I think they're catching on here quite nicely. Another popular Asian fruit that hasn't really caught on in the American market, but I'm starting to see it in at botanical gardens in the area and a few people's yards are the jujubes. And we are, yeah, they're a very popular plant here. Um, and they are Asian. And a lot of uh, folks that maybe had their parents grow up in China or Japan 
and then now you know now they're young but i mean their kids are young and the kids maybe uh have immigrated here uh, they they really miss the jujube so uh it's an it's a nice service we we get a lot of asian uh folks that really like jujubes and jujubes they don't get they don't really get bothered by anything and they're a pretty little they have little leaves that are shiny and bright they have small flowers that maybe bloom in say june so way way past any danger of frost and then the flowers are tiny but they smell like grape soda so if you have a few trees in your yard it's, it, there's some aromatherapy happening there and it's you know a certain time of the year and then the fruits a lot of people don't know exactly when they're ripe but they should be hard and and a, a nice brown color and then they're crisp and they taste like a sweet apple they have a flavor almost of a dried uh, maybe a dried pear but but they have a crisp crispness like an apple and um i would th- i would think there's a lot of ways that asian culinary uh, there's a lot of asian culinary uses for them uh because they've been you know for centuries they've been grown there but i do like them quite a lot yeah they're just fun they're they're another one that's just a pretty tree to have as well yeah and they're not a big tree so they're not overcrowding um you know they're not something most of us don't have a lot of room especially around the dc area so you want to pick, you know, you want to pick a couple of trees that'll serve you well. Um, and of course, we can grow our lettuces and our greens and our herbs uh, pretty much. Uh, you can do all of that in a very small amount of space. But the uh, the trees are another thing. I, I I couldn't see anybody growing like a chestnut tree, uh, you know, maybe downtown. But a pomegranate or a fig or a small or, or the blueberries or, or something small like the persimmons, the Asian persimmons. Yeah, I can see that quite a lot. And I think that does go on a lot in, in the, you know, downtown or Tacoma Park. And are any of them suitable for container growing? When you say that, I think of, you know, sometimes your roots staying outside year round uh, can be really damaged. So I would I would say the first the one that with the hardiest roots would I would think blueberry, um, I think maybe Juneberry, maybe some roses, but pawpaws, persimmons, I think they like to be a little bit lower in the ground than you know on top above the ground. And there are some figs that can be container grown, but would need extra winter protection for the container itself. Yeah, the container, you don't want the roots to suffer below 20 degrees. That's a good tip. And one fruit tree we haven't talked about at all are plums. Are there any favorite varieties that you have for eating? Well, the first thing I have to say about plums is that they can be very challenging because the plum curculio, that's its favorite host plant. And you'll notice uh, the plum curculio is this little quarter inch kind of um, armored little weevil. So it, it almost looks like uh, an ant, an ant eater's nose coming out of the front and it walks around and lays 400 eggs, one per fruit. Um, this one little, this one little insect is causing havoc on your, on your plant because what will happen is the little the little larvae go into the fruit and then come out you know eat through and go out the other end and then the fruit drops prematurely um and if you have curculio really bad you know it's it's not a uh, you're not going to get much fruit and and they are a prunus so they're related to peaches and and so the plums can get brown rot and especially a rainy season you can get you can get the brown rot so not the easiest plant to grow always. The first couple of years, you may not have um, considerable damage because it takes, sometimes it takes more time for them to establish. So, you know, you might, you know, you, plum trees will come into bearing pretty early too. So for two or three years, you may have a really great crop, but then it could happen that wormier and wormier every year that could happen. And so, 
So there are sprays and things to do, but again, that takes time and uh, you, you really got to love to get your fresh plums. Of course, there's not very good tasting plums in the markets usually, unless you go local and somebody picks them really ripe uh, because they just don't ripen off the tree. But what a great, I, I grow plums because they are, they really are that tasty. That sounds delicious. And for vines, you had mentioned, obviously, the hardy kiwi, which started off your journey. Um, But how about grapes? I know they were a serious challenge for Thomas Jefferson back in the day. Um, Organically growing grapes is still as difficult these days? It depends on what variety. Uh, Again, it's all about the varieties and, and maybe the species. Jefferson was trying to grow vinifera grapes, so our popular French wine grapes that everybody is familiar with. Those grapes here uh, do not like our rain and humidity, um, and they will perish if you just grow them. They'll perish in about two years. If, um, if you spray them every 7 to 14 days with different fungicides, um, you can get a really good crop. And that is what most of the wine growers uh, do in our, you know, in Virginia and Maryland. So what to do about that? There was a couple of breeders uh, that tried to cross the American grapes with the French grapes. And, and then you have some that are probably like Concord, really well known, that have a little vinifera in them. Although just about all those kind of bunch grapes, like, Concord or Niagara, they all can still get um, some fungus diseases on their bunches. So it's not always an easy thing. You need a very airy place to grow them. Um, You need to keep them elevated. Um, Even then, I take wax paper sandwich bags and I place them over the bunches when they're really small. I staple it over, you know, make a flap over the stem and I let them grow in the bag. That it sounds like it takes a long time, but uh, I only pick about 25 bunches off the vine. Everything else I cut off. I get big, beautiful bunches, uh, and there, and there's no disease on them because the rain cannot splatter the different spores that would fall on the grape. But if you don't want to do that, there's still hope. There are muscadine grapes, which is the southern native grape. Uh, that grows right here in Virginia, Washington, D.C. areas. And there's a lot of, a lot of, not a lot of work, but there's been work in breeding these uh, different grapes. And we have some really great ones and they're very productive and they don't get any disease. So I like muscadines quite a lot. And a lot of people think that you can't grow them here, but you can. So uh, it, it's, an, it's another really good choice for somebody that only wants to uh, manipulate or cultivate, but not not a lot of spraying or 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 insecticides, fungicides, kind of thing on the grapes. And do you think that wax uh, paper bag technique would work on other fruits to protect them from pests or disease? Oh yeah, in Japan, uh, most of your fruits are bagged, so they you can buy all kinds of fruit bags, different sizes. I just go to uh, a food market and get the sandwich bags that are made with wax paper instead of plastic. You can actually grow an apple or a pear in plastic. Yeah, I've seen those for sale, those those heart-shaped little cases that you can put around and and you can grow your fruits and vegetables into various shapes and for fun, obviously. But it's also protecting them, again, from pests and diseases. Right, it is. The the black rot that gets on grapes is like a freckle on a leaf, and it has tiny spores that are around the freckle. When it rains, those spores are released, and they go up into the splash of the raindrop. And when they come down, the spore lands, say, on a grape bunch, and then there it is. It's home. That's it. It'll feed on the sugars of those fruits, and then pretty much it'll it'll destroy the fruit so that you won't get anything. Well, it's a great technique to know about and obviously a little labor intensive, but, you know, 
I could see doing 20 to 30 fruits on a tree just to preserve those and then let the rest go to your birds or deer or whatever other wildlife. Well, if you if you cut them all off except for those 25, they get really big bunches. They look just like store bought, you know, they're very beautiful. The and you're right, it is it is a little labor intensive like this year we were so busy, I didn't get my grapes bagged and I've I haven't missed a year for maybe 7 years. This year I couldn't get out there. So um so what I'll I'll be getting a lot of muscadine grapes this year, but I think it's hit and miss with the other grape varieties that I sell or that I grow in the orchard. And by the way, we do have an orchard here, which is, you know, it's nice for a nursery to have its own orchard because you can see what the trees look like. You can see if when they get big, if they're too big for your yard, um, you can, you know, you can actually taste the fruit and uh, see if you like it too. And it's great to, obviously on breaks, you can just reach out and, and pick that apple off that tree. Yeah, you're talking about some of my uh, workers here, right? <laughs> <laughs> I could imagine it's very tempting. Um, and speaking of labor intensive, we didn't even touch on the topic of pruning fruit trees and the, the um, schedule that's needed there. Yeah, and I guess that, that could be another talk because, um, but generally... Um, grapes need, uh, that kind of annual pruning, uh, different species require different techniques. Uh, apples usually need a yearly pruning. Peaches must have a yearly pruning if you want to keep them easy to pick and lots of new growth and lots of new fruit coming every year. Uh, plums, um, well, some of the trees, um, don't need as much pruning as others. For instance, the Chinese che, which is like in the mulberry family, or the mulberries, if they're dwarf, I don't really, I don't really prune those. I don't prune pawpaws all that much. I will head back an, an American persimmon, just because they get they have a natural tendency to get too tall, and I want to try to keep mine spreading. And that works. I can get up into the tree in the winter and cut the uh, vertical branching, and I can get it to spread out. And then the persimmons don't need very much pruning. The Asian persimmons, they're uh, they're they're nice and full and compact, and uh, and they know how to grow without a lot of manipulation. So, and then you have you you do have blackberry pruning because the canes die and things like that, and blackberries will come up, and you need to tip them because they'll get so tall. If you know if it's raining a lot and you have good soil, oh my gosh, they'll get up. They'll get up quickly to eight feet. So once they're about chest high in, in June or early July, I will I will pinch them all back and make them lateral out. Yeah. And yeah, so there's pretty much every plant has its own uh, cultivation uh, considerations. And Mike, before I let you go, can you describe the cherry tree, the fruit, and the, the taste of those fruits? Well, it's an interesting... Uh, it's in the mulberry family, and for for years, uh, a lot of the fruit enthusiasts would talk about the che and how you had to have the male to pollinate the female. And one day, I guess we were just blessed, but one of my workers found a che growing at an estate in Ivy, Virginia. He called me and he said, "I can't find another male pollinator. This plant is seedless, so uh, so we sell the seedless che." And it's it's a very unique fruit. It's kind of like it looks cerebral, like, <laughs> uh, and it's red. Um, it's about it's not as big as a golf ball, maybe smaller than that, but it still has that kind of shape. And uh, then they're very sweet. And because they're in the mulberry family, they are um, really easy to grow, and they they don't really get any diseases. So um, it's not a big tree either. So I guess that's it in a nutshell. That sounds almost like the perfect plant for a small garden for t if you want to add a fruit tree. Right, right. Oh, well, small garden, uh, it could still spread out and take up, take up that space. So maybe not so much. Um, small garden... I still think maybe uh, one of the dwarf persimmons might be the better the better choice. Now I do have a mulberry that's called Girardi that I really like a lot, 
and it was introduced from uh, a nurseryman in Illinois. Um, it just doesn't get really big because it doesn't grow stems. It grows buds. So every inch or so, it puts out a new bud. So it may be eight or nine feet tall. And you know how big mulberries can get. Um, so it, this one will just stay small, and it produces quite a lot. So I do like these dwarf mulberries, too. Oh, excellent. Does it seed itself around? No, I haven't seen that happen. Um, and we do get a lot of birds visiting here. I have seen some uh, peaches from maybe the squirrels robbing a few peaches and take, taking them into the woods. I've seen some pawpaws outside of our nursery, and I've seen June berries a lot. Uh, the June berry is, is like a blueberry fruit, not fussy about soils. It's a Native American fruit. And it tastes like blueberries. And do you know which? You, do you know blueberry? Mm-hmm. You mean the June berry or the shad? Yeah, bush yeah. Or sometimes sometimes referred to as Saskatoon berry as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Okay, good, good. Mm-hmm. And it has just like that tiny little almond like seed in the middle, but it's it's such a beautiful tree in itself. The service berry or June berry. Yeah, and they 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 produce vivid white flowers in the spring. One of the first things to bloom. And then they're followed by the June fruit. Yeah, I really like them a lot, especially the bush, the bush ones, because they they're easier to pick. Yeah. Definitely, because one of the hardest things about fruit trees is reaching those fruits t- and to safely get them down. You don't want to have spend too much time up on ladders. Yeah, right. So for our listeners to the podcast, how can they reach you, Mike, and how can they order? these wonderful fruit trees and uh, are you open for visits in person during this period? So that's, uh, that's one thing good about an, an outdoor nursery like this is there's a lot of space so people can keep their distance quite well. And we have been going out to the customer with a clipboard and kind of taking the order that way. So we don't get, you know, any people really in the buildings. Uh, But then the greenhouses are quite open. There's fans going on in there all the time. So you do get the customers, but because we're in the middle kind of of nowhere, um, we get a lot of customers. But at the same time, it's not like your local drop-in retail center. So, uh, you know, a couple of cars at a time are usually up here. Um, And that that works. So it's worked well for us this year. Um, And then I think you asked me something else. Oh, for online ordering for those who can't make it down to visit you in person. Yeah, we send um, we send our plants pretty much every week of the year, and because we grow everything in pots, and we start with like two inch pots, four inch pots, quart pots, gallon pots, three gallon pots, five gallon pots, and we kind of stop there for shipping. Unless you get a freight of the trees and you want seven or fifteen gallon, we actually have those too, but they're usually pickup items because they are expensive too to ship. But we do, uh, we do mail order and we have edible landscaping.com. Uh, that's our website. And, uh, yeah, so that's, we get an awful lot of orders online and we do send all over the United States. Mm-hmm. And I noticed at edible landscaping.com, you have, um, YouTube videos up that demonstrate some of the fruit and some of the technique. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the things we've talked about, there are some YouTubes. And then this year we did a virtual tour because we didn't have our All About Fruit Day. So uh, that's up too and available to watch. So I go around in the orchard and I show the different uh, plants. Another popular video is my persimmon one that I did last fall. And George and I, he, he, he was, he's the cameraman and I'm walking around uh, showing the different attributes of the different persimmons. So that's a, that's a about an 18 minute view. So it takes a little while, but it's, it's a good one. Well, wonderful, Mike. Thank you so much for lending your wisdom and experience on fruit tree growing and for having a local source of organically grown fruit trees for the metropolitan DC and greater mid Atlantic area. Well, I was born in DC, so it's very kindred to my soul. <laughs> <laughs> And thank you again. All right, dear. Thank you. Plant 
profile, crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtles are native to Asia and were introduced to the United States in 1790. Crepe myrtles are known for their colorful, long-lasting flowers that bloom in the summer. The flowers are borne on long branches and panicles of crinkled blossoms with crepe-like texture. Flower colors vary from deep purple to red and white, with almost every shade in between. After flowering, it produces seed capsules that start off green then turn dark brown. It is not necessary to cut these seeds off unless you find them unattractive. In the wild, most crepe myrtle are multi-stemmed large shrubs, but today it is possible to find a crepe myrtle filling every landscape need from small trees to dense barrier hedges to container-sized varieties that grow only two feet tall. The practice of topping off crepe myrtles to keep their growth in check is not advisable. Instead, pick a variety that is bred to reach full maturity at a smaller size. One of the joys of crepe myrtle trees is its brilliant fall color and in the winter, its beautiful exfoliating bark. It takes a few years to develop that bark texture, so give it time. Many of the newer crepe myrtle varieties were developed at the U.S. National Arboretum in Washington, D.C. These were bred to be disease resistant and hardier for northern climates. They are generally hardy to zone seven. If planted in colder zones, they die back to the ground each winter, but with care and lots of mulching, will regenerate new growth from their roots. Natchez, Sioux, and Muskogee are three of the most popular National Arboretum introductions, with many more being developed by other people. Some of the newer varieties have burgundy leaves with blooms from purple to brilliant pink, and others are dwarf in form. Crepe myrtles bloom on new growth, so you can prune them in the early spring if you so desire, and they will still flower that summer. Crepe myrtles flower most heavily in full sun. Other things that may cause crepe myrtles to bloom less are too much water, lack of heat, and over fertilization. Note also that crepe myrtles are one of the last plants to leaf out in the spring. So if you think yours might be dead in April, give it until the end of May to prove its case. Crepe myrtle, you can grow that. For this week's What's Blooming in the Garden, I'm so happy to share one of my favorite flowers that literally jumped up overnight in bloom for me, and that's the Naked Ladies. You might know them by other names, Surprise Lily, Magic Lily, Resurrection Lily. The Latin name is Lycoris, and truth is, they're not lilies at all. They're in the Amaryllis family. They're gorgeous and a great cut flower as well, lasting over a week in the vase, and they smell so lovely to boot. And they grow from a large bulb, similar to an amaryllis, no surprise there. It can take a year or two to recover after you get them from another gardener or from a catalog, and have a little patience with them. They're an old-fashioned favorite. You'll often see them coming up around old abandoned home sites. If you're lucky enough to inherit some pass-along bulbs, you can also order them from heirloom bulb companies. In the spring, the foliage comes up and then quickly dies back and disappears. You'll forget all about them. In midsummer, after a good soaking rain, the tall stalks will suddenly shoot up and the flower will appear without any foliage, hence their colorful nicknames. They're the ultimate set it and forget it plant. Lawn Alternatives, Low Maintenance Yards. We're coming up on the season for lawn renewal. Before you go to all that trouble this autumn, take a few minutes to consider replacing all that turf with something easier, more attractive, and earth-friendly. Maintaining a lawn of turf grass is one of the most expensive and time-consuming uses for your land. Constant mowing, fertilizing, weeding, watering, reseeding, edging, and aerating 
not only eat up your resources, but can be harsh on the environment. Lawns do not absorb water runoff as well as planting beds and many of the chemicals you use to maintain it are toxic to the nearby stream beds and Chesapeake Bay. Our lawns are not necessarily the green dream we envision. For a better part of the summer and again in the winter, your yard is brown. In addition, when encroaching weeds and attacking insects such as grubs, the dream of a solid green field of glossy grass is next to impossible to achieve. Why put yourself through the stress and heartache? Here are a few ideas to get you started in reclaiming that lawn for better use. Expand your planting beds and establish new ones. Fill them with a mix of perennials, annuals, bulbs, ornamental trees, and shrubs. Once established, the maintenance is minimal. Just cut back the perennials in late winter and replant the annuals in late spring. Cover slopes with shrubs that grow to form solid plantings. You'll be relieved not to have to push a mower up and down that hill ever again. For full sun, look at ground cover roses, and for slopes and shade, try out cotoneaster. Both will give you year-round interest and will flower nicely each spring. Replace wide swaths of lawn with green ground covers, ajuga, vinca, ivy, and pachysandra. Do well under many growing conditions, but you might want to look at some native alternatives. Hardy geranium is also a nice lawn alternative, especially under shade trees. Others to try include different varieties of sedums, creeping phlox, and creeping jenny. Get trendy. One of the newest ground cover fads is moss. From a distance, you'll achieve that same solid green look without anywhere near the maintenance. Moss is an ideal lawn alternative for areas in deep shade that stay moist, such as near your gutter drains. You can also lay it out in interesting color patterns and styles. For a touch of whimsy, try a checkerboard or a plaid. Go back to basics. Growing your own edibles at home is a vast improvement on constant lawn grooming. Start a vegetable patch, plant a fruit tree, or an herb garden. Get the kids involved and make it a family project. Dig in and build a water feature. A pond, waterfall, or stream bed is one of the most charming and desirable elements you can add to your home landscape. You'll soon find that your water feature is a gathering place for friends, family, and many types of wildlife as well. Map out hardscaping. Is there a place where lawn is being worn into a natural path for foot traffic? Stop fighting it and go with the flow. Put in pavers, stepping stones, or formal brick walkways. Line it with interesting plants. Add a bench or hammock at a convenient resting point. Let it go wild. Establish a wildlife habitat by reseeding part of your property with native wildflowers. Joe Pieweed, Black Eyed Susans, and Goldenrods are just a few of the flower seeds you can buy by the pound and grow to attract birds, bees, butterflies to your yard. Consider other uses for your lawn. Look at places where your turf grass or other ground cover never get established. If nothing will grow in that area, maybe that's the place to put your deck, patio, children's playhouse, compost pile, storage shed, or wood pile. Go ahead and try one of these lawn alternatives. Once you get started reclaiming that sod for better uses, you won't want to stop. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support. For as little as 99 cents a month, you can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support Garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener Magazine. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, 
and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.